People can hear me. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't up to the mark on that. And well, I could be talking to you about how to do remote hearings, and I couldn't even sort that out, but never mind. Anyway, um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the St. John's webinar. I'm Roy Light, and I'm going to talk to you about alcohol licensing. That will be for 20 minutes. And when I finish, Matthew O'Regan will take over, and he will talk to you about UK subsidy control after Brexit, uh, particularly for local authorities. Then there'll be 20 minutes of question and answers, which we're encouraged to stay for if you can bear it. Now, uh, my topic is ever changing, as is Matthew's, I think. And I've got a way out of this because if I can't understand what I'm trying to tell you, that's fine, because the Prime Minister couldn't understand it himself yesterday, uh, and it's his government introducing the rules. So, um, no political statements, but just to say that things are getting rather complicated uh, and pity the poor landlord trying to run his public house or the restaurant her trying to run his restaurant or her restaurant uh, in these difficult times. Right. We all know what's happened over the last six months. In March, the pandemic came and we got locked down uh, and the Coronavirus Act 2020 gave the government sweeping executive powers to do basically very much as it wanted to do. Uh, in order to try to stem the tide of the coronavirus. Now, that's, uh, uh, those powers are for six months. There have been question marks about how they've been introduced uh, and whether they've been effective and so on. Uh, and Parliament increasingly has decided it would like to have some say in this. Uh, and today, in fact, this afternoon, there will be um, a debate, or if the Speaker allows it, uh, on whether or not Parliament should have some say in these powers. So this, the, the six months is up today for this Act, and whether it's renewed or not in its present form, we'll find out later on today. Now, if you go to the last page of the notes that I gave you, um, one of the um, sets of regulations is laid out there. Um, this is the sort of thing that a hospitality venue has to do now. So if you're running a public house, say, or, or a restaurant, uh, you have to uh, have no more than six people come in together. Those six people have to wear masks unless they're eating or drinking. They have to sit down at tables from which they have to order their food and drink. Uh, and um, <clears throat> they have to eat their food and drink, also be seated at the table. Uh, they mustn't mingle with another group of six. So if there are six people sitting there, one of them decides to go to the toilet and on the way they see some pals, um, they're not allowed to start chatting to their pals because that would be mingling and mingling is not allowed. Um, so the person running the business uh, would have to take all reasonable care to make sure they didn't do that, because if they did do that, um, that person would be committing a criminal offence. Tables have to be two metres apart or one metre apart if uh, there's a screen between the tables or if the people sitting at the table are sitting with their backs to each other, in other words, away from each other. And then some new regulations got introduced on, I think it was Sunday night or Monday night, I can't remember now, um, five hours before they came into force. Um, and you mustn't allow more than six people to sing or dance anymore. So if six people start singing happy birthday to you on a table of six up for a birthday party and another table joins in, criminal offence, criminal record um, and all that goes with it. So not an easy task, particularly if you look at the um, government guidance for the hospitality industry, keeping workers and customers safe during the lockdown and uh, during the coronavirus. And I don't know if you can see this, but you probably can. That's it. Um, that's in its 35th edition. So um, I'm sure that all of the license holders uh, and proprietors of these premises will avidly wait for the new edition to come out uh, and read it. OK, so that's the background. It's really difficult for a license premises at the moment. And I suppose what we take from that is that this isn't the time to be pernickety uh, or to cause issues and problems which can be avoided. This is the time to try to um, have some sort of mediation and some agreement and to try and facilitate um, businesses being able to carry on and authorities being able properly to regulate those businesses. Now, applications. Um, applications are being made for licenses still. Um, whether there are any applications for new licenses um, at the moment, um, it, it's quite a brave venture for people. I've done a few new applications recently. Um, and, um, they have to say they were applications which were put in um, before March uh, and are now being heard. So 
Um, I'm not sure how many applications are around, uh, but applications are being put in um, and they're being heard remotely. And in my experience, they're going well. The remote hearings are going well. Things are happening as they should. Um, local authorities have adopted a pragmatic, pragmatic approach, which the uh, guidance from the local government association has suggested they do. Now you'll see there are footnotes with links to various documents. Um, so hopefully most of the useful documents, which you might want to have a look at, um, you may already have seen, but if you haven't, there are links at the bottom, so you can just click onto them and you can find more information and get the detail of them. Um, technical hitches, there have been a few, but they haven't been too bad. Um, clients I've advised to dress properly, um, and you'll notice I'm not wearing a tie, I apologise for that, but um, I tell my clients to wear shirts and ties and suits and to look smart, and one client did that in Cainshaw, I think it was, um, and he looked very nice um, in, the, uh, in the Zoom meeting until he crossed his legs and there were bare knees there. So clearly he had his shorts on because it was a very hot day. So I had to communicate with him to cover up a bit, which um, I think he did. So um, other hearings had local councillors um, lying on comfortable looking sofas, um, having a cup of tea during the meeting. So I quite like that degree of informality uh, and I think it probably helps the sort of round table discussion. And importantly, it probably helps um, people who are used to those sorts of um, applications and hearings to feel a bit more relaxed because people often feel quite flustered, like I am now, when I know people are watching me and I can't see them and I don't know if they're turning me off, turning me down, turning me up, muting me or whatever they're doing or calling their friends and say, come and have a look at this, this will make you laugh. So hopefully that's not happening. Okay, now the thing that is causing problems is appeals. Um, we had issues with appeals before, uh, the length of time appeals were taking, the fact that magistrates courts often don't have much experience in licensing appeals uh, and therefore it was quite difficult sometimes properly to execute them. Unsurprisingly, with the magistrates courts suffering enormous backlogs at the moment, um, there's, a, there's quite a delay for appeals. We listed an appeal, um, I'm acting for the local authority in the west of England uh, on Friday it's a three-day appeal to the Magistrates Court um, and it's going to be mid-February. So mid-February is probably not bad actually, it's not a bad result, but it is quite a long way off. And the reason it's a problem, as you would all know, is that if a licensing committee has some troublesome premises, say a pub is causing problems and issues, they review the license of that pub and they say to that pub, right, your license is suspended or they just take their license away and they revoke the license, that doesn't come into effect until any appeal is um, determined or abandoned. So that means in the appeal we're doing, it's not the case, it's not a review, but if it was, it would mean that these troublesome premises would be able to carry on until mid-February, which would include Christmas and New Year. Um, and who knows how late they'll be able to open till then, we don't know, do we? But um, that's an issue, a problem. Uh, similarly, um, for an applicant who doesn't get the um, variation that they wanted. So for example, a supermarket may want longer hours because of various reasons it wants to sell alcohol um, to people to provide better service, to try and keep in business. Um, and if they refuse their extension or they've got conditions on the license that they can't live with, again, they're going to have to wait some considerable time before they can get their application heard. So, so that's, that's not a good idea either. Prosecutions. Um, there have been fewer prosecutions. Prosecutions are often not used in licensed premises cases. Generally, review hearings are used rather than prosecutions. Uh, and there have been fewer prosecutions. I was involved in one prosecution in London for underage sales. Um, two people were involved in that. They, they had several court dates. Each court date was then put off and put off and put off. And then the latest court date was sometime in the future. That's very unfair on uh, a license holder with an otherwise unblemished record with no criminal history to have a prosecution hanging over them for this period of time. Uh, and also the magistrates, I'm sure, have got far better things to do than to deal with um, somebody who's made one underage sale to a test volunteer after 20 years in, in the licensed trade. So the local authority um, were content when we offered um, to set up a, a raft of conditions um, which would hopefully prevent any underage sales in the future uh, and also a caution, a simple caution was suggested and that was agreed and the matter was disposed of, which was a very good way of dealing with it um, for the local authority because um, they could see that this person had owned up to what he'd done and also had a caution which marked that um, offence. But there were conditions put on the licence uh, and that 
would obviate the need for any review hearing to change the license because we did that by way of minor variation. So the conditions that were being put on a review were already on there. And also for the courts, which were uh, given an extra, however, half a day or a day to do some prosecutions rather than some um, license, license prosecutions. Now, remote hearings, remote hearings are great, aren't they? Um, you've all done remote hearings and you've all enjoyed them. You've all had your issues and problems. I don't know whether you've had you know, people coming in, saying and doing things that they shouldn't have done because they didn't realise you're in there. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting here at the moment. Um, there's nobody going to come in. Uh, my wife's sitting in another room doing hearings at the moment. So, you know, it's a high level activity in this house. And I hope if Bristol are listening, that we get a rebate on our council tax. Well, perhaps I'll have to pay more than the business premises now. Right, so as far as remote hearings are concerned, um, there was some doubt about whether they were legal to start with, and lawyers like nothing better than arguing about those sorts of issues, but those arguments happily were put to bed quite quickly. And the um, local authorities, police and crime panels, coronavirus, flexibility of local authorities and police and crime panel meetings, England and Wales regulations 2020, um, say that uh, remote hearings are lawful. So that's England and Wales. Um, they can be held remotely, um, all sorts of uh, ways of doing it, like we are at the moment with Teams, with Zooms on the phone. I did a two hour hearing the other day with half a dozen objectors by phone. I didn't find that particularly good. It's quite nice to be able to see some of the other people who are involved in it rather than just doing it by telephone, but sometimes that's not possible. And often it depends on whether the people involved have access to the necessary equipment to be able to, to, be able to do it remotely. Um, that brings me on to saying that what you have to make sure of, of course, is that everybody's able to take part properly. Not everybody may have the technology, not everybody may have the knowledge or the ability. If there are, uh, if there's legal representation, that's generally OK, because they will have experience of using remote facilities and they will also have experience of doing hearings. But it's very important if remote hearings do take place, that everybody has a fair chance and a fair hearing. And of course, the Equality Act has to be um, complied with. So if there are any difficulties that people may have, they're in a protected category or they're vulnerable or whatever, then, then that should be taken into account and um, um, adjustments made, reasonable adjustments made. Um, and you can also adjourn matters if, 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 if adjournment is necessary, and that's provided for in the um, hearing regulations. And I've got a note of that down there for you. One of the interesting things is, um, and um, We've done a bit of it today with um, the people who've organised this for us, Emily and Hannah, is um, the need to contact people in the course of a hearing when um, you don't really want to do it on air. So I don't, wouldn't really want to say to Hannah, Hannah, I don't know what to do next, um, but I could send her a message to her phone saying, Hannah, I don't know what to do next. And she'd send me one back telling me what to do. So sometimes when you're in a hearing, you need to take instructions from your client. Um, but you can't really do that in a Zoom hearing and say, excuse me a second, when I take instructions, ask your clients and your client replies. Um, but you can do it. For example, if you set up something like a, a, a WhatsApp group. So generally I set up a WhatsApp group. So if, for example, someone is giving, a uh, local resident is giving evidence and saying, we don't mind if they open till 11, but we 12 o'clock's far too late. I can then send a message saying, would you agree to 11 o'clock if necessary? And I can know whether that's something I can agree to or not agree to. Um, two things you have to be very careful about. First, you have to make sure that the person you're dealing with has access to that sort of facility because they may not. Secondly, they need to be able to um, verbalise their answers in a way that are quite clear so that you don't have any mistakes if they're not very literate, if a language of English isn't their first language, for example, you have to go to that. And what is a real concern, perhaps not so much in licensing, because of the nature of the proceedings, particularly in court proceedings, is how do you know that someone's not coaching the witness? So, you know, you have to probably perhaps think about saying when a witness is giving evidence, if it's a particularly um, important piece of evidence that they start to give, to ask them whether they're on their own. Um, or whether there's anybody else in the room with them, because there may be somebody in the room with them saying, oh, say this, say this. Um, and it's not actually the, um, the view of the person giving the evidence. Someone's coaching them. So that's a difficulty, I think, with remote hearings, what you do about that, perhaps more so in criminal cases um, and in family matters in particular. Um, but you have to try somehow to make sure that there's not um, some sort of coaching going on. OK. Um, 
The Legal Education Foundation did some research in remote hearings. I put it down there for you to read if you want to. Uh, one of their findings was that these remote hearings work best for um, uh, short and uncontested matters. And they say these findings suggest tentative support for reserving remote hearings for matters where the outcome is likely to be less contested, where the hearing is interlocutory in nature and for hearings where both sides are represented. So all licensing hearings are contested. That's why they're there. So that doesn't bode well for licensing hearings. But my experience is that licensing hearings do go well, um, even though they might be contested and you may get lots of objectors and um, lots of discussion going on. Right, alcohol delivery services. I haven't got that much time left now, so I'm going to scoot. Um, alcohol delivery services, uh, issues with alcohol delivery services are many, uh, but it's not a licensable activity. So if someone has off license on their license, they can do alcohol delivery services. On their license, how do they get off license? Uh, that's been covered now because the Business and Planning Act says they automatically get off license facilities. So um, pubs, which didn't have off sales, now do. Uh, also table and chairs, it was often difficult to get table and chairs licensed. It was quite a complicated procedure. The Business and Planning Act has simplified that now. Uh, and that's why we see lots of tables and chairs outside restaurants and pubs and people out there having their drinks. I won't go into that in any more detail now, but I'll just go on to compliance. And as far as compliance is concerned, I've listed all the sorts of criminal offences probably be out of date by tomorrow, but they're there and they form the basis of the criminal offences. But the interesting thing for licensing is what part does COVID and COVID related issues, what part do they play in licensing hearings? I did an application last week for a, um, a sports bar uh, and one of the councillors said, uh, they show live, tele uh, live football and rugby matches. One of the councillors said, um, yeah, but what happens because when someone scores a goal or a try in a game, men and perhaps women as well all jump up and start hugging each other. How are you going to stop them hugging each other? Um, because no one's allowed to hug each other. So is that consideration that you can take into account and say we can't give a license for this bar because the uh, applicant can't guarantee there'll be no hugging going on. So um, you know those are the sorts of issues that might arise and also a very important issue which might arise is if premises are reviewed because they breached the COVID regulations, so for example, a pub that I was involved in, which I was active authority, which, uh, which opened during lockdown when it shouldn't have opened, the police brought review proceedings, but they brought them on the basis of public health. And as you all know, while health authorities are responsible authorities and can um, take part, there is no public health licensing objective. And therefore the police uh, had to fail, it couldn't succeed. Now, the two questions are, one, should they have brought it under uh, crime and disorder because it's a breach of a criminal offence, if you're breaching the regulations, it would it have succeeded there. And secondly, how about the public safety licensing objective? Because presumably, if people are, are not observing COVID regulations in a pub, the public safety of the people in the pub are put at risk. Well, the answer to that, as far as the statutory guidance is no, because the statutory guidance says at paragraph 27, this concerns the safety of people using the relevant premises rather than public health, which is addressed in other legislation. Conditions should not be imposed on a premises license which relate to cleanliness or hygiene. Now, there are two things there. One is, yes, it relates, relates, to, but relates to, um, within the premises and perhaps the proviso is to stop concerns about public health outside, for example, too many people are drinking too much and it's causing problems with people's health. And the second is when these regulations were written in April, uh, this guidance was written, sorry, in April 2018, we didn't have COVID. So perhaps now it should be included in that. So that's a big question mark, which perhaps you all wanted to ask, ask me, uh, and you may ask me in the question and answer session, but I can't guarantee you an answer. Spot on. Um, 1020. So thank you very much for listening to me and I hope to speak to you again soon in the um, session later on and I look forward to the flood of instructions you'll be sending me because you were so impressed with this performance. Um, and now over to Matthew O'Regan. Matthew. Uh, good morning everyone, can you hear me? Great, you can hear me. Um, well thank you Roy, that's um, very interesting, illuminating in relation to licensing, uh, state aid or subsidy control, as we uh, now have to call it in the brave new world of a uh, sovereign independent nation. Um, 
is something upon which unfortunately there is uh, still not a uh, an enormous amount of detail as to what will happen after the uh, transitional period ends at the end of this year. Um, I had hoped when this presentation was originally conceived in June that I'll be able to provide you with a detailed assessment of what would happen, but uh, uh, we're not there yet. Um, there is a uh, a more detailed note which has been prepared, and I do hope you've all received a copy. Um, as we'll see in, in a moment, there were some more developments last night um, in relation to what uh, uh, may happen, um, which I'll address this morning, but they won't be in the note, but I will uh, endeavour to uh, prepare an updated uh, version after we have, uh, have finished. Um, as I say, the government has not yet published details of the regime that will actually be put into place. Uh, much less said when this will actually take effect. But uh, in an, an announcement made on the 9th of September, the business secretary uh, did give some generalised indications as to uh, what it might look like. Um, as you'll be aware, one of the remaining key issues in the ongoing uh, trade negotiations concerning the future UK-EU trade agreement is state aid or subsidy control. Uh, that is because under the political declaration of the uh, 19th of October 2019, uh, the EU and the UK committed to a uh, level playing field for uh, open and fair competition, which included, amongst other things, uh, common high standards in state aid with a, a robust and comprehensive framework for state aid control that prevents undue distortions of trade. Uh, but as is clear from the negotiations, uh, the UK and the EU clearly have uh, different approaches and understandings as to uh, what that means. Whether they will in fact be able to resolve uh, this issue uh, is something that remains uh, unclear. And obviously uh, negotiations are continuing uh, this week. Um, so today I will address uh, three things. First of all, how the state aid rules apply before the end of 2020 and potentially thereafter under the withdrawal agreement. Uh, secondly, what the government has said so far on uh, a new subsidy control regime. And thirdly, uh, the scope of the WTO rules on subsidies, which the UK government intends to um, apply domestically. Apologies for the inter slight interruption there. That's one of those annoying uh, internet calls uh, uh, asking whether I've been involved in an accident or something like that. Uh, anyway, so firstly, uh, the application of the EU state aid rules in the UK under the withdrawal agreement, as you all know, the EQ UK left the EU on the 31st of January. Uh, but under the uh, negotiated withdrawal agreement, there's a transitional period in which EU law continues to apply in and to the UK until the 31st of December. Uh, that includes state aid rules. And so uh, that means uh, for local authorities and other bodies which are either um, uh, giving, uh, making grants or other state aid measures, or indeed in some cases uh, benefiting from uh, uh, grants, for example, under the uh, uh, ERDF, European Regional Development Fund uh, funding, uh, it's necessary to ensure that there is compliance with the state aid rules um, and that requires a number of uh, questions to be considered and uh, many of these questions have in fact come up on in recent matters on which I've uh, been asked to advise. Uh, firstly, it's necessary to consider whether the measure constitutes state aid at all and um, uh, there are a number of reasons why it may not do so. Uh, these include that the uh, the grant or the uh, whatever it is is not uh, for an economic activity. Um, secondly, it's not funding for a specific business, but is funding that is available to all businesses uh, generally. Uh, thirdly, and this is often an important one in uh, in a lot of aid schemes um, or aid measures involving local authorities, is that there will be no effect on trade between the member states. Or I suppose, as we must uh, now say, between the uh, EU twenty seven and the UK. And finally, and this is something that has uh, come up recently in some of the cases I've been involved in, uh, there may be no aid because it's an investment or a loan that's made by a local authority on market terms such that the uh, market economy operator principle is, uh, is, is satisfied. Um, secondly, if we conclude that the measure in fact does constitute state aid, it's necessary to consider whether it may be exempt from uh, notification. Uh, there's a whole raft of different uh, uh, measures uh, which may be relevant here. Most important ones, as you'll, you'll know, are the de minimis regulation, uh, the general block exemption regulation 
and the uh, various rules applicable to uh, services of uh, general economic interest. Uh, and thirdly, if um, uh, it, it's the case that uh, an aid measure is not exempt from notification, it will be necessary to uh, consider making a notification to the Commission, in which case the aid cannot be implemented until it has been approved. Um, fortunately for me so far this year, there hasn't been a problem. Uh, measures have either not been aid or have been exempted. But as we'll see in a minute, there have been uh, a number of recent notifications of uh, aid by, uh, by local authorities, which has uh, required approval from the Commission. Um, looking forward, the uh, withdrawal agreement contains a number of provisions on state aid, uh, which are relevant. Uh, firstly, the Commission can continue any state aid investigation that it has commenced before the end of the transition period. So that's in relation to aid that is granted uh, before the end of the transition period. But even if uh, notification is not made, um, so uh, either aid is so an aid is implemented without being notified, the Commission can, for up to for another four years, that's till the end of December of 2024, investigate uh, aid granted during the transitional period. Uh, so that means that if aid is implemented without notification, um, the Commission can investigate or can even start an investigation even after the end of the transition period, for example, if there is a complaint. So there's a, a fairly long arm of, uh, of potential compliance uh, obligations there. And thirdly, um, decisions adopted by the Commission during or after the transition period under the provisions of the withdrawal agreement are binding in the UK. Uh, any appeal will be to the General Court in Luxembourg with a further appeal to the Court of Justice. And any Commission decision can also then be relied upon in, uh, in national court proceedings. And finally, uh, somewhat controversially and something that we're probably all aware of, um, not least in relation to the debate regarding the Internal Market Bill, is that Article 10 of the Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland contains rules on state aid in relation to Northern Ireland in relation to goods and also electricity. And they will continue to be supervised and um, enforced by the Commission. Um, I don't think there's anybody uh, from Northern Ireland uh, on, the, uh, on the webinar today, um, but the provisions of the protocol are considered in more detail in my notes. So it's important that the, uh, to understand that uh, state aid law continues to apply until the end of the year and uh, the Commission's role in enforcing it will continue to be relevant in the UK for uh, some time to come. And in fact, the Commission has, since the UK actually left the uh, European Union on the 31st of January, uh, adopted a number of state aid decisions concerning the UK. Uh, some of these have been uh, national UK-wide schemes responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, whilst a number of others have concerned uh, local aid measures by devolved administrations and uh, local authorities. Uh, one good example of this is a scheme by uh, Cardiff City Council to provide grants to uh, bus and coach operators to uh, retrofit their buses and coaches uh, with new emissions control technology to uh, improve the, uh, uh, the local environment. Um, this required notification to the Commission uh, because whilst it was aid, um, it wasn't exempted under the, uh, the block exemption regulation because uh, the level of aid was above the uh, maximum levels that were allowed. So notification was made on the 31st of March and it was approved on the, uh, the 5th of August. Um, the Commission, you may be wondering why uh, grants to uh, bus operators in Cardiff engages the state aid rules at all. Um, the Commission in its decision considered that the grant was aid as it would strengthen the position of bus companies operating in Cardiff as compared to uh, competitors in other member states, um, such that it was likely to affect trade. Um, in passing, this demonstrates the low threshold for the uh, effect on trade criterion to be, established, to, be, uh, to be satisfied. I mean, how many bus companies from elsewhere in the EU are in reality likely to uh, set up operations in Cardiff? Uh, probably not very many. But in, uh, happily for the Council, the aid was approved by the Commission as environmental aid. Um, there was also a similar scheme uh, in Scotland that I think was by the, uh, the Scottish Government, uh, which was also notified and approved. 
So state aid is continuing to be important until the end of the year, so we mustn't uh, forget its, uh, its relevance. Um, secondly, future regulation of subsidies in the UK. Um, Mrs May's government had intended the UK would have a domestic regime uh, based on the EU rules. Um, it had been very, very similar with the Competition and Markets Authority having responsibility for uh, supervising state aid. But uh, following the election of Mr Johnson's government at the back end of last year, um, the current government has decided on a, a very different approach. Uh, the UK will not be following the EU approach to subsidy control and uh, will have its own regime, which will be uh, based on the WTO rules. And we'll come on to what they are in a moment. Um, on the 9th of September, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy announced that we would be following the WTO rules, but rather frustratingly and disappointingly didn't provide any concrete proposals, but merely said that uh, detail, uh, further details would be about announced uh, next year. So that's after the end of the transitional period. Um, what that means is that the um, existing EU state aid rules will, uh, in, the, in the Secretary of State's words, become redundant and will be removed from the statute book. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, there will be guidance for public authorities and devolved administrations on the WTO rules, which the Secretary of State said will be published by the end of the year. But uh, we know nothing more about that at all. Um, from a policy perspective, interestingly, the Secretary of State said there will be no return to what they described as a 1970s approach of bailing out uh, unsustainable companies with uh, taxpayer money. Um, there will also uh, be consultation next, which will be, probably be next year now, on uh, whether the UK should go further than its international commitments uh, under the WTO rules and adopt further legislation on subsidy control. I think it's likely that there will be further legislation. Um, it also seems that there may have already been some preliminary consultation with uh, certain businesses, uh, but there's nothing uh, public on that at the moment, and it's not clear whether um, that includes, um, uh, has, there has already been consultation with local authorities and bodies such as uh, local enterprise partnerships. Um, as you may have seen in the paper this morning, uh, the Internal Market Bill received its third reading in the Commons last night and is now in the, uh, the House of Lords. Uh, under the bill, the regulation of uh, subsidies uh, to persons supplying goods or services will be a reserved matter uh, to be dealt with at a UK-wide level, which is uh, politically controversial. Um, the devolved administrations have objected uh, since, unlike competition law, uh, state aid is not addressed in the Dev Devolution Act at all, as whether it's a reserved or a devolved matter. But it does uh, indicate that um, the new regime will apply to both goods and services. Um, there's a fairly broad definition of subsidy in the bill, which actually is uh, fairly similar to uh, a state aid measure under EU law and also the concept of a subsidy under WTO law. As a, a guidance as to what we can expect, uh, the Secretary of State said in his announcement that uh, uh, the UK subsidy control regime would ins ensure that subsidies do not unduly distort competition. Um, it gives the example of a Scottish firm is not unfairly undercut or disadvantaged by a subsidy given in England and vice versa. And importantly, um, that uh, big companies will not be able to play off the regions, nations, towns and cities of the UK against each other in a competition uh, to extract taxpayer subsidies. That would tend to indicate there will be a fairly um, uh, comprehensive regime. I mean, how else can distortive subsidies and subsidy races uh, be prevented without a, uh, a, a fairly detailed uh, regime? Uh, the note sets out uh, over a dozen important questions which are as uh, yet unanswered, uh, each of which I hope will at some stage become clearer, but uh, that may well not now be until uh, until next year. Um, important, particularly important to local authorities will be whether there's a de minimis threshold of uh, aid to which the new rules uh, do not apply, uh, whether or not uh, there will be control of subsidies uh, to local businesses, or whether local authorities will have more freedom to support local business. Um, importantly, will there be block exemptions as under the EU uh, system? 
albeit probably called something else. Um, for, importantly, also as part of the uh, broader regional development and levelling up uh, strategy, uh, will there be areas in which greater subsidies will be permitted in order to assist with uh, regional development? Um, an interesting development last night was the publication of a draft statutory instrument to remove EU state aid law from the statute book as of the 31st of December. Um, clearly not in the note yet. Uh, this draft SI has the snappy title of the State Aid Revocations and Amendments EU Exit Regulations 2020. Um, it will to some extent require a cold towel to be wrapped around one's head as uh, some of the amendments to existing legislation are, look like they're fairly complex. Um, the important thing is that uh, EU state aid law will cease to be recognised and applied in the UK as of the 31st of December. But importantly, this does not affect existing rights and remedies that were uh, available at that date, which will continue to be enforceable in the courts. That means that third parties will be able to continue to challenge unlawful aid uh, granted before this date, uh, including by uh, continuing an existing claim or bringing a new claim, usually by way of judicial review. It also means that unlawful aid that's been granted before this date remains subject to potential recovery. Uh, so don't think that you're able just to uh, uh, give out uh, aid now without considering the state aid rules. Um, all existing EU regulations and decisions uh, related to state aid will cease to apply. It includes the de minimis uh, regulations and the general block exemption regulation and also the uh, various rules applicable to um, services of general economic interest. And this is where the cold towel comes in. Thirdly, various other uh, retained EU regulations, so not ones that are uh, part of state aid rules, but uh, uh, do refer to them, which will be retained in national law and certain UK legislation will be amended uh, to remove references to state aid. Uh, and in some cases, they will make reference instead to the WTO agreement on subsidies and uh, countervailing measures. Um, it seems quite clear that there won't be a new regime by the 31st of December and that therefore will leave a gap in subsidy control from the 1st of January for uh, to some period, which may well mean that uh, uh, the government and uh, public bodies will be able to, uh, to grant subsidies without any restraint. Um, time is moving on, so the WTO rules are set out in more detail in the note. Importantly, they only apply to goods. Um, WTO regime has two uh, types of subsidy. Uh, first, there are some subsidies that are prohibited outright. The key one of those is an export subsidy. Uh, the second category is what they call actionable subsidies, but they can only be controlled if they have adverse effects on other WTO members uh, by causing injury to uh, another member state, another WTO member country's domestic industry, or by distorting trade in products that have been subsidised. Uh, the reality is that this is only likely to be the case uh, where there are very large subsidies. Uh, a good example is the eight subsidies that have been granted to Boeing and Airbus over the years. Uh, and that would tend to suggest that uh, subsidies granted by uh, local authorities, which tend to be relatively small in amount, are unlikely to, uh, to breach the, uh, the WTO rules. So in conclusion, uh, what does all of this actually mean? for local authorities. Uh, the first important point is don't ignore the EU rules. They remain applicable until the end of the year. And uh, if aid is granted in breach of the rules, uh, there remains a risk of investigation by the Commission as well as uh, national proceedings uh, by affected third parties. Uh, second one is the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, applies only to goods. It seems unlikely that uh, a subsidy granted by a local authority in Great Britain will fall within the scope of the protocol, uh, but it isn't limited to uh, aid that is granted to uh, companies physically in Northern Ireland, nor indeed to uh, aid granted by uh, authorities in Northern Ireland. So in appropriate cases, one may need to consider the protocol. Uh, as I mentioned, the WTO regime is unlikely to be uh, applicable to uh, small subsidies granted by local authorities. But in appropriate cases, it may need to be necessary to consider this uh, going forward. And of course, guidance is awaited from the government. Um, in terms of the new regime, it's very unclear what it will be, but um, it seems certainly from the uh, 
the public announcements, but also the uh, draft SI uh, published last night that a very large and new broom is being taken to state aid or subsidy control in the UK with all references to EU law being removed. So it's EU, EU law out, WTO law in. So an entirely new regime. Um, and finally, this means that uh, going forwards, uh, local authorities' ability to provide grants and soft loans and the like and to invest in businesses remains uh, somewhat unclear. Uh, but there will seem to be an enforcement gap in, uh, uh, starting on the 1st of January next year, which may provide some space for authorities to uh, uh, grant subsidies without uh, being um, controlled at all. So uh, that is all from me. Thank you for listening. Uh, apologies for the lack of clarity. Uh, hopefully uh, you, uh, we've been receiving some questions and Roy and I will now be uh, very happy to answer them. I think there is one on to word already, isn't there? I don't know if Roy wants to answer the uh, Roy, you're on mute at the moment. Hello, Nick. Hello, Nick. Um, I have no idea, I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, whether the singing dance regulations only in England rather than in Wales. Um, it came out the other evening. Um, and um, I apologise. Sorry, I'd uh, accidentally muted myself. Um, as Emily says, it doesn't look like there's uh, any more questions, but if you should have any more, uh, please do either contact uh, uh, that come to your mind later. Please do feel free to uh, uh, contact uh, Roy or, or me as appropriate um, uh, afterwards. As I said, I, I will be updating my notes. Um, these, both Roy and I seem to be in fairly uh, fast moving uh, areas at the moment uh, for good or bad so there will be uh, more future developments to come um, so thank you for for, uh, for attending it's very much appreciated um, this session has been recorded and I think will be available uh, either on Chambers website or perhaps on uh, YouTube I'm not oh we have a question sorry before we finish uh, which has come in from my, uh, Michael Rayner's uh, what are the Chamber's view on IRAL? How is it likely to affect administrative lawyers? I'm not quite sure I understand what that is. I don't know what you uh, uh, know about that. Roy, do you uh, know what IRAL is? I'm just Googling it. Well, perhaps, um, Michael, if you're still there, you could uh, expand upon your uh, your question. The International Review of Applied Linguistics in Language Teaching. Independent Review of Administrative Law, I think, is probably what um, yeah. uh, uh, Michael is getting at. Yes, he's just, just said that himself. Um, this seems to be a, a general reform process of uh, how judicial review will uh, uh, be in the future. Uh, it's an independent review. I can't tell you. Am I? Is this working now? Can people hear me now? Yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying that this is Chambers' view, but we are in Chambers preparing a response to it at the moment, uh, and we are concerned about the implications of it and the way in which it will restrict access to the higher courts to um, challenge uh, ad administrative decisions made by public bodies. So at the moment, all I can say is that um, we're alive to it. We're preparing a response to it. Uh, and the general feeling um, is that um, that response needs to be quite a strong response because it does seem to um, to be quite quite a, 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 
a limitation on um, the scope of judicial review. Peter Wadsley's leading that, so I, if you'd like to contact him, he, he'd be able to tell you more about the answer. Yeah, I think it's something that the bar of the council is obviously looking at as well. Uh, I think barristers generally, lawyers generally are quite concerned about uh, about that and restricting obviously access to the courts is uh, is quite troubling. So perhaps that's a topic for another webinar. But not by me, by Mr Wadsley. I suspect so. I mean, looking at uh, on, online, it seems that the call for evidence is uh, running until uh, the 19th of October. Um, so if people are concerned, um, there is a, uh, uh, a means for uh, um, submitting comments or responding to their, uh, their call for evidence. So, um, well, th thank you very much. I don't know if there's anything, Emily, I've forgotten in, uh, in, in closing other than to thank you and say that uh, it, it will be available online. And if you do have any more questions, then uh, do contact us. Thank you.